I've been thinking about this morning for at least uh, six weeks, uh, if not two months, uh, because it is when we present uh, third graders their Bibles. And so I started thinking about maybe making my sermon uh, having to deal with the Bible uh, in ways uh, that I haven't uh, so far. And lo and behold, um, uh, uh, that's where we are, or that's where I am today. And uh, today will be the first time in at least 12, if not 13 years, uh, that I am going to deliver my uh, sermon from the pulpit. Uh, for hundreds of years, uh, the pulpit has been where their word has been proclaimed. Uh, I'm doing it this morning because um, unlike my other sermons, uh, I'm not going to go in kind of logical order. Uh, you may think I'm scattered all over the place on any given Sunday, but I'm really not. Uh, at least I try not to be. But today, since I'm going to be just all over the map, and since yesterday or half of yesterday and, and Friday evening, uh, I was in a meeting with John and some of our members and a, a consultant in a wonderful uh, day and a half retreat. Uh, I just didn't get the time to try and get everything organized the way I normally do. So anyway, that's why I'm uh, going to be in the pulpit this morning. But first things first, let's uh, look at the quiz here. I hope you had a little time to at least glance at it. Uh, if not, uh, uh, circle the answers. The first part, who said it? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Was that Jesus, Jeremiah, James, or Moses? You will find it in the fourth chapter of James, verse 8. God helps those who help themselves. King Solomon in, in Proverbs, uh, Paul, David, or Ben Franklin. Anybody put Ben Franklin? You're right if you put Ben Franklin. 1736. I spent uh, probably the first 12 years of my ministry trying to find that verse in the Bible. Uh, kind of a slow study. I said, hmm, maybe it's not in the Bible. So I went and looked. Uh, I have a great big book on famous quotations. And e even there, it's not sure or it's not certain who said it, uh, who said it first. But it is uh, attributed by most people to, uh, for Benjamin Franklin to have said that. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Elijah, John the Baptist, Jesus, Isaiah. We normally hear this in what time of the year? Christmas, Advent. And it is some wonderful words like there are so many wonderful words in the book Isaiah. True or false? You're the man is in the Bible. You'll probably hear that uh, this afternoon if you watch the golf uh, game on TV. Uh, is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. It is from a very famous scene where Nathan confronts King David uh, with the essentially killing Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. And the way Nathan does it is he tells a story, tells a little parable to David. Uh, and David gets really mad at the man in the story. And then Nathan finally says, you're the man. You're the man. That's found in the book of 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. I know that my Redeemer lives is in the Old Testament. True. It is in the book of Job. Luke's gospel contains the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. True? What'd you put? Wrong. <laughs> it's in the gospel of John. It is, I told you to be careful now and to pay attention. Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the Bible it is in the Bible, but it's in the book of John, not in the book of Luke. Eat, drink, and be merry is in the Bible. True or false? That's right. Many, many times, as a matter of fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, you will find those words. 
eat, drink, and enjoy, and be merry. So enough of that, uh, Falderal. And another reason I did this was to uh, let you experience uh, four out of the five parts of the Bible. It's kind of hard to generalize when you come to the Bible, uh, but in the Bible, it's basically made up of five parts. One part is history and law. We find that primarily in Genesis and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, but not just there. But history and law is one part of the Bible. Um, the prophets, the words of the prophets, those who spoke for God, uh, they're in uh, the Bible. Uh, the books of wisdom, we have Ecclesiastes, uh, we have Proverbs, we have the book of Job, and then in the New Testament, the book of James. Those are the books of wisdom where we look for day-to-day -day advice on how to live. Then, of course, there are the Gospels where we learn about the life and teachings of Jesus. And then the preponderance of the rest of the New Testament are the letters of Paul, letters where he wrote to individual churches as well as some individuals uh, and instructed them on how they were to live. So let's begin at the beginning of let's, how to approach the Bible. How do I believe, now this is me, and some of which I'm going to say uh, uh, this morning, uh, you already know, you're already practicing, uh, and if so, then fine, maybe this will reinforce it. But this is what I believe. You're not going to find it in any official Methodist publication. How do I believe that the Bible came to be? Now, I'm not talking here about the work of biblical scholars, theologians over the centuries that have poured over all of the documents and the sources for the Bible. I'm talking about a faith issue, the source of the Bible. And there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the Bible did not come just from human efforts alone. The Bible came from Almighty God. Now, how did this occur? Did God uh, whisper in the ear uh, of uh, the, the ones who then wrote it down? Or did God guide the hands of those? Uh, uh, with the words that God wanted, or was there some kind of combination? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, just like there are so many things in this wonderful, marvelous, majestic creation of God uh, that we call our world, so many things I don't understand how they got there or why they work. I just know that God, uh, that the Bible came uh, from God. Uh, the Bible is timeless. Uh, even though parts of it are uh, more than 2,500 years old. Uh, the Bible speaks to us sometimes as if it were written uh, this very morning. Uh, it's true. Nothing can prove that it is false. It touches the very depths of our souls, touches us in ways that we had no idea we could be touched. But the Bible can do it. The Bible produces a sense of wonder in so many different ways. I want to share with you just three or four of examples of how my life has been touched with a sense of wonder. One is that magnificent verse from Job. When Job writes, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and at last... Forgive me. And at last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, then without my flesh I will see God. What a magnificent statement. And it is so true because why else would we be here this morning except that Christ, we believe, has indeed risen and that Christ is alive. Then there are the wonderful words I believe I read last week or referred last week or the week before from Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season 
and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate. Again, 2,500 years old at least. Then the words of truth and wonder, you weep what you sow. I think a couple of weeks, three weeks ago, I, I made reference to that. These are some words that Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. And we know as a farmer, as a gardener, you can't plant tomato seeds and hope to harvest cantaloupes. Well, in life, what Paul is telling us, we can't expect to go out and sow discord and hope to reap love or happiness. But if we go out and we sow grace, we will reap grace, we will receive grace, the same way with love. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Those are the words of Christ that we find in the Gospel of John. And indeed they are true. If we continue in the word of God, if we continue to be a follower of Christ, then the truth will set us free. The truth will set us free from lies. The truth will set us free from the chains of this world. We will be set free. The words of Paul in describing the church that he writes in 1 Corinthians, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. I cannot imagine Paul, the apostle Paul on his own conceptualizing that, but that it, because that is so timeless, priceless, and so right. Every one of you here this morning, no matter how young, how old, how you're dressed, how tall, how short, you're a part of the body of Christ, and not just this church, but the church around the world. We are all vital parts, just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the eye cannot say to the foot, because you're not an eye, I don't need you, you're worthless. Or the hand can't say, because uh, I'm not a, a, a mouth, uh, I'm not worthy, worthy. No. Every single piece, every single part of the body is necessary. Certainly true for the body of Christ. Well, how should we approach the Bible? How should we plan to read it? Well, approach it, number one, for what it is, the Word of God. Number two, approach it prayerfully. We should read it in an attitude of prayer, asking God to not only open our eyes and our minds, but for God to open up our hearts as well. By all means, we should use some of the tools available to us, some of the aids that we have. For example, more than one translation. You ought to have more than one translation at your home or in your office. It really is helpful at times to read simply a word or to read a phrase and, and just have it uh, uh, expressed in, in just a, a little different way. Our Wednesday morning Bible study that we have with about oh, anywhere from six to 15 gentlemen, uh, about uh, eight of them come with different uh, translations. And, and inevitably every single Wednesday morning Someone will say, well, what, how is that read in another translation? And what appeared to be a stumbling block for us, something that just didn't make sense, all of a sudden makes sense. And that's just using another translation. One or more commentaries is necessary. I have three commentaries where we can look up a, a certain passage and read what the original context was, read what the original audience might have been, and find help explanations. And then another absolute uh, necessity is a concordance. How many times have you thought of a word or thought of a part of a verse and you, you wanted to find the whole verse or you wanted to find who said it? Uh, if you go to a concordance, you can look up that word or maybe a phrase and you will find where you will see it listed for every single time it's used. Well, where should I go if I want to find a certain thing in the Bible? For example, prayers. Well, when you're feeling down and out and you want to know, offer a prayer to God, 
Go to re and read Psalm 6. Or if you're feeling up and you're feeling great and you want to thank God and you want to praise God, go to Psalm 138. The Lord's Prayer. Where do we go to find that? If you want to see, well, what was the, to whom was Jesus speaking? Uh, what was the occasion? I'll never forget it was, uh, gosh, now 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I was greeting people as they were coming into the church where I was serving. And two women came up, and they both came directly to me, and they said, we want you to settle a dispute we're having, an argument. One of them said, I believe that the Lord's Prayer is found in the book of Psalms. The other one said, oh, I believe and I know that the Lord's Prayer is in the book of Genesis. Now, it's not my fault they said that, because I'd only been there about a month or so. So I said, all right, time out. Wait a minute. Let me see if I can help you. I said, who said the Lord's Prayer? And they said, Jesus. And I said, bingo. I said, where do we read about Jesus? And they said, in the New Testament. And I said, bingo. And I said, where in the New Testament do we read about Jesus? And they said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I said, bingo. You will find the Lord's Prayer in Matthew and Luke. You won't find it in Mark and John. Um, but it was what Jesus gave to his disciples, what Jesus gave to you and to me uh, to use in prayer. What about if you want to read about the church? Go to the book of Acts and go to 2 Corinthians. Or if you want to help raise children, or if you need some help raising your children, does anybody need any help raising their children? Anybody need any help raising their grandchildren? Go to Proverbs Ephesians and Colossians. Advice on how we should live our daily lives, that's wisdom. Go to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, James. Where do we find the Ten Commandments? Maybe that's where we ought to start if we are beginning to explore the Bible. We find the uh, Ten Commandments in the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter of Exodus. Finally, if I could only give one word of advice about how to approach the Bible, I would repeat what I have said for more than 20 years. Take the Bible seriously. The last argument, or the last time I got in an argument with somebody over whether to take the Bible literally or whether there is an error in the Bible, that was of around 26 years ago. I decided that that's missing the point. I don't know if there are any errors in the Bible. Uh, I don't know about literally or not literally taking uh, the words of the Word of God. But I do believe that God wants us to take the Bible seriously. In the words that we read, in the words that we hear spoken, we need to find the word that God has for us to hear or to read. That's what's most important to hear what God wants us to learn, to hear what God wants us to use in our lives. That's the most important. So I want to close by reading again. I invite our third graders, I meant to do this earlier, turn to page 604 in your pew Bibles. Excuse me, I'm talking to the, excuse me, third graders. But you can turn in your pew Bible, there's no law against that. Turn to page 604, and you will see <clears throat> the great big number 22, which means that's the number of the chapter. Then look for the little bitty 17, 18, and 19, and those are the verses. And I'm getting ready to read those very words once again. Incline your ear and hear my words, and apply your mind to my teaching. For it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, if all of them are ready on your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have made them known to you today, yes, to you. May God add God's blessings to the reading and hearing of this portion of, our, of God's holy word this morning.